Stephen, welcome to the Upgraded Executive Podcast. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. It's good to be here. Great place to start would be if you could just share with the audience your background and how did you get into biohacking? I always had an orientation towards taking things apart and putting them back together and to figure out how things worked and, you know, building forts and tree houses as a kid. Oh. And biochemistry is kind of like machinery. It's, uh, it's, you know, reactions and you have, you know, reaction paths that are like, you know, the flow of gears in a clock and my part for just how the world works. And then it came into focus in high school when I discovered explosives and, and fire and that kind of stuff and a kind of closet pyromaniac. And, <laughs> and then in college, when my grandfather died with Alzheimer's disease, he was kind of like a mentor to me in terms of teaching me things like, you know, archaeology and astronomy and things like that. And so his passing was one of the first, in a sense, non-traumatic deaths in my family, where I actually, instead of trying to avoid it, I thought about it and decided to study Alzheimer's disease. You've been biohacking now for how long? More than 40 years. So when Dave Asprey <laughs> calls himself the, the godfather of biohacking, or the real godfather of biohacking? I would say, you know, grandfather of bio biohacking. I'm one of the the old fogies who, in a sense, <laughs> started this without even knowing that it was biohacking. I had been biohacking for 30 years before the term was even coined. <laughs> Some people, they're really interested in biohacking. Or I find just because of the word biohacking, they get really put off. Or attracted to it. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Absolutely. I think, plus, also, British people are always quite skeptical. So they hear the term biohacking like, that can't possibly be a thing. For me, it's all about just being able to optimize yourself emotionally, mentally, physically, so that you're in the best possible position to live the life you want. Yeah, and I think it comes down to fundamentally learning to speak uh, body language. And I mean that not in the sense of your posture and your ex expression and stuff, but through pain, through sensation, through functionality. And... I think there's a tendency for people, especially because as teenagers, we feel we're immortal and we're indestructible. We start to notice that things aren't working as well as they used to. And so we have this tendency to want to force the body to do things that the way they used to be and that we can push it and that we want to be in denial about things that aren't working as well as they used to. But you know, if you learn to speak body and you learn to pay attention, to observe how your mind works, how your body works, all the subtleties involved, your body can communicate to you whether or not it's responding positively to something. There's a certain wisdom in knowing those kinds of things, just like if you respond to NADH or not, or you respond to CoQ10 or not, or to ketosis, um, uh, high carb diets, uh, vegan, you know, or mostly vegan versus, you know, carnivore diets, you know, what is your particular sweet spot for your functionality? And I think those are the kinds of questions that biohacking allows you to answer with a certain degree of assurance instead of just, you know, having it be philosophical. If you don't invest in finding out answers, there's not enough benefit to change your habits. And if you don't change your habits, whatever you figure out, it's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to look at your motivations and think about what it is and to, to have an attachment to doing a biohacking experiment. Mm -hmm. You know, because, you know, your grandfather died of Alzheimer's disease, bad PMS symptoms, or because you get tired and want to take a nap at four o'clock in the afternoon, these are the kinds of things that motivate people to look for an answer. You know, uh, things aren't as good now as they used to be. Now, smart drugs, there's a, a really fascinating topic because I think also that's another topic that I think can be quite divisive for some people because some people feel that it's cheating or some people yeah. will feel as though you're getting an unfair advantage. Topics have helped me an enormous amount. How would you help define what nootropic is for the audience, Stephen? Well, there's the drug meaning of it, which is yeah. the paracetam, the racetam family. And 
but I look at it as a more general phenomena of anything, uh, you know, vitamins, minerals, nutrients, herbs, or pharmaceuticals that enhance some aspect of performance, whether or not having better memory or better speech abilities. It feels like there are a number of things that could give you a cognitive boost, and they're not always smart drugs. Oh, no. Lifestyle aspects like good sleep and, and exercise and uh, keeping your blood moving. You know, if you're sitting at a desk like I do in front of a computer all the time, take breaks and to go out and take a walk and, and uh, you know, loosen up your, your frozen rear end. Whatever it is that, you know, in a sense resets you, whether it's music or, you know, booging in the kitchen or walking down the hall or having a conversation with somebody, whatever way feeds you spiritually, physically, emotionally, to invest in that in all the different levels of your being. Yeah. Sounds a bit woo-woo, but I'm, I'm a firm believer that there's a lot of aspects of beingness that aren't just about consciousness. I find with a lot of clients that when they do try a supplement or a smart drug, some people will say, like, I feel incredible, and others have no effect. And I guess we're all our own experiment, really. We're all N equals one. That's right. And if you don't look at the data, you know, in other words, you take something and you go on with your day and you're oblivious to paying attention to things, you can end up either not taking anything, which is a common you know, thing, yeah, I tried this and that and the other thing and none of it works. Uh, or you end up taking everything and, you know, where you're, you're dealing with fistfuls of supplements. One of my favorite smart drugs of choice is a nootropic. It's paracetam. And I discovered paracetam in the early 90s. And it changed my life in ways that I noticed, like my ability to write and edit and speak. I have a typical diminished corpus callosum between the two sides of my brain because of my testosterone poisoning. As a result, my language abilities are dramatically inferior to my spatial 3D mental capabilities. And when taking Prasitam, that deficit between those two abilities closes. And even though most of the people in the world, when they hear me speak or they see my writing, think that, oh, I'm gifted in that capacity when actually I struggle to be good at it. And so Prestem gives me that. And I've tried other nootropics and uh, they don't work the same way. They don't work to the same degree or they have a kind of maybe unpleasant stimulatory feeling that kind of grates on me. Whereas mm. Prestem for me, transparent and I don't feel like you know, maybe I'm on caffeine or something like that, where I can, I can notice a certain edginess to it. Prasitam is very transparent. It's not, it doesn't affect me in any way that I can notice. That's the first time I've heard of this. This isn't a subject that I'm particularly knowledgeable on. So it's going to be a fascinating conversation just, just to hear from a global expert in terms of the subject. So is that legal? Where could I buy that from? Uh, how does it work? Well, the legal aspect of Prasitam depends upon where you are and even about whether the law is actually being enforced or not. Uh, here in the United States, I buy kilos of Prasitam for like $80 and half a dozen companies at any given time are selling it. But technically in the United States, Prasitam is not a dietary supplement. It's a drug and it's an unapproved drug, and it's not likely to ever be approved. Uh, we have our FDA, which is a really you know, pathological organization and does great harm. And you know, they have a legal mandate to approve drugs that are submitted to them. And because Prasitam is generic, there's no profit incentive on it. It's never going to be approved here. There's a certain lawlessness in the United States or maybe a kind of cowboy mentality that we do things specifically illegal until somebody says to us, oh, we have to stop doing that. And so 
companies are selling paracetam openly, even though it may not be legal. And every once in a while, the FDA will send them a cease and desist letter and they'll stop selling it. And then another company pops up and starts selling it. So even though it's not approved, but before that time, I bought it from uh, the Netherlands and from England and from South Africa and parts of the world. It's over the counter. So I take aniracetam, which is very similar to paracetam. And maybe Steve can help us understand the difference. I buy my aniracetam from the States and have it imported in and there never seems to be an issue. Right. But if it's approved, like paracetam is approved in the UK, oh. um, you can get it prescribed and mm. um, obtain it you know, with a prescription, which, you know, if you're a police officer or you work for the government, you may need to do that just to have that kind of legality so mm -hmm. that nobody um, is concerned about your, you know, your use of the pharmaceutical. In the UK, for example, Prasitem is used to treat myoclonic seizure disorders in newborn infants. And whereas in the United States, using Prasitem to treat myoclonic seizure disorder grounds for losing your license. So, it's a pretty bizarre world. Stephen, what's the difference between aniracetam that I use and paracetam? Do you know? They have molecular similarities for most of the molecule, and part of it is just slightly different. And um, you, you know, if you attach a phenyl group to it, it makes it more fat soluble and gives, slows down its metabolism. And and you know, oxiracetam has an extra. These is just slight variations on each other, and that provides a different kind of experience for people. A nice story that I've told about when I first did Prasitam, I noticed its effect on my editing and my writing abilities and my speaking abilities. But it was my coworkers who noticed that I became multitasking. They could come in and interrupt me because I wasn't being derailed. I was much more agreeable to being interrupted. And they noticed that, not me. It sounds like he's doing something cognitively so you're having something's going on but how would you yeah in layman's terms how would you explain what's actually happening to me there's an anti-anoxic anti-hypoxic mechanism that prasitam allows your brain to function on less oxygen but for me it's all about left brain right brain coordination and communication and males have a small corpus callosum so as a result because of this difference you find that women generally have better verbal abilities than men across the board and prasitam is a way of kludging a male mind so that it behaves more like a female mind when i take anamastam i don't really feel it so when i take it and i'm working you know i'm working well i'm effective but if i've forgotten to take it that morning that's when i really seem to notice it that i'm not quite on it like i normally am that's what I call transparency. It's like through glass. You can't really see the glass unless there's a wind outside and not inside, or you reach out and knock mm -hmm. on it, and you can say, oh, okay, it's glass. If it's really clean, you know, windows are really clean, birds will run into it because of the, they can't see the, the glass. A lot of the racetams are like very, very subtle. For me, aniracetam isn't that subtle. I notice a certain level of stimulation from it mm -hmm. that I don't get from paracetam, and it's not my favorite smart drug of choice, but for you it is. And it's the same way for me, noticing when, if I'm having a verbal ability or I can't think of a particular word or I can't multitask. In other words, I can't take a side trip down a, a discussion and remember what the original point of the discussion was and come back to it and continue. I can't do that as well. Are there any other smart drugs or nootropics that you take? Well, I consider Depranil a smart drug, but I think most people wouldn't because it's motivational. It mm -hmm. deals with a very primitive part of the nervous system that deals with sex and dominance and assertiveness and territoriality and competitiveness and things. Without Depranil on board, I'm much more passive than I was when I was 40 or when I was 20. But with Depranil, it gives me back some of that passion for life and my life is better on Depranil than not. In summary, you've got more energy taking it. Well, it's, it's not even energy. I mean, I would think about energy as being mitochondrial in nature, whereas dopamine is about drive. It's about wanting to change the world instead of just being passive and taking what happens. And it's a kind of outward directedness. 
And how does GHB fit into this? Well, it was one of those battles that I fought with the government and lost. <laughs> I used GHB for years before it became criminalized here in the States. And it was amazingly beneficial because it's a way of producing very, very deep quality sleep. It's a really good patch for improving quality of life, especially in um, middle-aged and older people. And because it was used by young, in a sense, misused or overused, it set a really bad example. And so the people who really would benefit the most from it were denied it by its criminalization. It has prosexual properties for both sexes, although does interfere with male performance in maybe some ways it might be considered by some men to be deleterious. Female perspective, slowing down men is a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> and it improves orgasm in both sexes. It's an anti-stress agent. It's an excellent substitute for alcohol. You get all of the disinhibition effects of alcohol without any frying of your brain cells or pickling of your liver. It's a hundred times cheaper than the price that's currently being charged for it, or maybe even a thousand times cheaper. So it's very, very economical. And that was one of the reasons it was so popular in youth culture. With all your amazing knowledge and experience, I don't do any of this stuff currently. Using Pareto's principle, where's a good place to start? Because like you said, I, well, I have taken um, uh, supplements before and I've had a shadow of them. It was ridiculous. You know, when you get the, the capsule boxes and I had to get a second capsule box because I was like, I need to take this, this, this and this. And it was just getting ridiculous. But what would be your take these for maximum bang for buck? Well, the maximum bang for the yeah, buck yeah. is typically B-complex vitamins. They're incredibly inexpensive. They are like, you know, the gears of a clock. You take one of them out and the clock stops functioning. They're that fundamental. They're necessary and essential. And, and because they're cheap and they get no respect. What's your view on psychedelics, Stephen? I've used them. I, I haven't for, I don't know, 30 years, maybe even more than 30 years. They were transformative for me. And I've certainly had conversations with people who've used them. And that's not unusual, that they're transformative. They're a great way to explore consciousness, resolve, for example, traumas, or to open up ways of looking at the world that can be beneficial. When I did the Cognitive Enhancement Research Institute in the early 90s, I made a decision at that time not to do, not to talk about psychedelics. Um, and that was more of a public relations decision than it was, you know, anything of personal interest to me. I've always been interested in, in psychedelics and, and other pharmaceutical aids as part of a way of exploring one's mind and exploring the, the levels of one's consciousness and the way different neurotransmitters play off against each other. I ended up writing about that side of the series called The Designer Brain, where I deliberately would push my acetylcholine nervous system towards dominance, and then my dopaminergic system, and my serotonergic system, and my noradrenergic system. And I would play with these things to see how was I, what aspects of personality changed, what aspects of performance changed. And so I learned a lot about myself by deliberately exploring that technology with nutrients and pharmaceuticals so it wasn't in any way psychedelic. The more you're aware of yourself, the more you can respond to other people instead of react to other people. I tend to use the tropics and smart drugs as a tool. So I think apart from anoracetam, which I take most days, Monday to Friday, I tend to just take them as and when I feel that I need them. Something that I do take on a fairly regular basis is a supplement that contains coenzyme Q10 and PQQ and I've used it myself and I've used it with a number of my clients and it's a particularly high quality supplement. They get a real surge in energy. I find the coenzyme Q10 and PQQ really effective but then as you were saying earlier Stephen I also have clients that will take something like unfair advantage and feel nothing and it just comes back to it's a you, know, you are your own experiment.
NADH, for example, people with Parkinson's, half of them will respond to NADH, whereas in the general population, it may be only 5%. And so also as we age, our bottlenecks in our metabolism can shift. So if you take PQQ or coenzyme Q10 and you have a bottleneck, it's like light switch. And if you've, your CoQ10 level is fully normal and sufficient and you take it, it's, you know, it doesn't do anything at all. Mm-hmm. So that's in a sense, the way I look at biohacking is this search for bottlenecks in our efficiency so that we can then become more fulfilled and more powerful, more energetic. Um, there seems to be like new supplements and new smart drugs and new stacks coming out every single week. They're all popping up on Facebook and Instagram. But how does somebody find something that works for them and avoid the snake oil? Because you could, mm-hmm. you could spend hundreds searching for the right thing that works for you. Yeah, and many of the things that, that you can try will give you an initial benefit that can be profound, and yet they're not sustainable. So, for example, the cholinergic nervous system is very much involved in memory and intellect, but it's also involved in motor control and coordination, dexterity, and things like that. And cholinergic, you know, nutrients, choline, phosphatidylcholine, um, and a lot of these different formulas because uh, a noticeable benefit the first time they take it. But after a week, the effect is attenuated. The body has reestablished a normal relationship with that cholinergic input and has downregulated the system. And after typically three weeks to four weeks, there is no benefit. And that's been observed in the majority of people. Because people feel it the first time they take it, they tend to reorder. I have a certain level of distrust of this kind of aspect of the industry that a lot of it is pandering to first-time experiences or pandering to unreal expectations. So, you know, how many of you have heard of the, you know, B-complex 25s, for example, or B-complex 100s, where you have 100 milligrams of all the B-complex vitamins or 25 of all the B-complex vitamins? Incredibly popular. The B-complex ratios are all badly skewed. You know, normally you'd want to have way more B5 than B12 or 6. And you want to have even more B3 than B5. And so if you have 100 milligrams, way too much B12 and 6, and you have way too little B5 and B3, and yet somehow it's okay that that's the standard in the industry. You know, if you have three bottlenecks in your metabolism and you take a formula that addresses one or two of those bottlenecks, you still don't feel fully you know, functionalize, even though you may blatantly notice what's going on. And so you can get stuck into complacency. And part of biohacking is to do experiments where you isolate different effects so that you can discriminate what to spend your money on. And so if you take CoQ10 and nothing happens, you go, okay, well, you know, I don't need to do that now. And maybe I'm going to wait. Or you say, okay, yeah, I am a CoQ10 responder, and you put that into your daily regimen, knowing that you're getting a benefit from it. And maybe once every year or something, you go without CoQ10 for a week. If you notice it's gone, if you do, then it means, okay, I've reinforced that thing. I'm still needing CoQ10. That's, in a sense, a kind of wisdom that you can't get from a stack. Is it possible to hack a hangover? So you can go out, you can have a good time, have a few drinks, and then not have a hangover in the morning. Uh, Yes, I've done it and uh, produced a formula, designed a formula that I donated to a group that produce it commercially. There's a couple of people who tried it and it hasn't worked. And those are people for, for whom acetaldehyde is a big metabolic issue. They have an abnormal gene for metabolizing acetaldehyde. And even with this formula, it doesn't clean it all up. Even though there's a big benefit and they still have a hangover, it's just, you know, mild instead of severe. They tend to be Asians and Irish. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the Irish because they just drink too much. <laughs> yeah, well, part of the reason that they drink too much is that when you first start drinking, if you have one of these 
NADH deficiencies that's fairly common. For those people, when you give them alcohol, alcohol dehydrogenase converts NAD to NADH. So it gives them NADH and all of a sudden, in one minute, they feel human. That's very seductive process to, you know, and so they drink alcohol and for 10, 20, 25 minutes, they feel human. And then the the synthesis of acid aldehyde overwhelms that NADH. And if they get their hangover and they feel worse. Mm -hmm. And so, but if they keep drinking, they keep that acid aldehyde crash from, from manifesting. And so they learn this very fast. You just keep drinking and you're fine. (laughs) <laughs> and then at the end of the day, you have to stop drinking. And so what they do is they pass out. Instead of going into sleep, they pass out. They pass out on the couch. They pass out on the bed. They pass out in the chair. They pass out in the stool at a bar. And they look like they're sleeping. You know, their eyes are closed and maybe they're snoring, but their brain waves are not sleeping. They're suffering from acid aldehyde toxicity. And there's all this massive disruption going on. And that has to run its course before they can actually go through sleep. But if you're an alcoholic and you know the H issue, you can take NADH or you can take, for example, butyl alcohol, which gives you the same NADH rush, but no acid aldehyde. Mm -hmm. So you get all the benefits of drinking in terms of energy and feeling human. There was a nice uh, study that was done in 1975. They found out that by giving vitamin C and cysteine or vitamin C and glutathione or vitamin C and N-acetylcysteine, that one could mitigate this alcohol toxicity, acid aldehyde toxicity, able to block an LD90 dose of of acid aldehyde, which kills nine out of 10 in the animals, take it to LD0 with this formulation. So that's how effective it is. It's incredibly effective, but the timing is critical. You have to the the cysteine and vitamin C at the same time your alcohol is being metabolized. And if you're not, you still get a hangover and all of that. It just mildly mitigates it. But if you take this concurrently with your drinking, you're able to escape 90% of the downside of drinking alcohol. Because I've always found taking activated charcoal while I'm drinking and then glutathione at the end of the night seems to do the trick for me in terms of reducing hangover effects in the morning. Well, the charcoal works on a different mechanism. The charcoal is about all the congeners and things. So if you're drinking you know, gin or single malt whiskey and stuff like that, or single malt scotch, those have all kinds of chemicals in them that aren't acid aldehyde mediated. And charcoal does a good job of absorbing them. Vodka, which is very clean alcohol, has minimal congeners, uh, congeners the charcoal won't be of equal benefit. The stack that you mentioned that helps you avoid a hangover, is that available commercially? um, It's called Alcohol Detox. It's about 10 bucks for, I think it's either 30 or 60 capsules. And so it's way cheaper than the alcohol you're actually drinking. Yeah, that is really good value. We'll have to do a review. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) we'll go down the path. Yeah, I actually had a guy who had... You know, was had problems with alcohol, who was getting married, and his buddies were going to drag him to Las Vegas for a bachelor party celebration. And he was incredibly nervous. So he got a hold of me and I told him about this and he went out and did it. And, and he forced all of his buddies to do it too. He said, okay, I'm willing to drink alcohol with this formula if you will take the formula at the same time I did. And he said, every one of his buddies were amazed at how amazing and he managed to survive he was half asian in his heritage and so that's where he got his bad aldehyde dehydrogenase gene and um, but he survived his bachelor party and got married (laughs) brilliant (laughs) if you have a bad alcohol dehydrogenase gene it'll show up on your genetic testing and you'll know Mm -hmm. but Chances are, if you're an adult, you already know that you don't handle alcohol gracefully because, you know, it's a rite of passage in most cultures in the world that mm. when you turn 18 or you turn 21, or you, that you then go out and, and binge on alcohol. Or maybe it's, you know, in the past, it's been smoking cigarettes as a rite of passage or doing a spirit quest as a rite of passage. I mean, all cultures have some kind of thing like that. And it's odd. It's usually the things that are denied us as children that serve as a rite of pass on alcoholism based on nutritional treatments. Joan Matthew Larson 
and then um, another author, uh, Byron or something like that, who a book entitled Drink As Much As You Want and Live Longer. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> totally worthless title, but he got his message across. And mm -hmm. they recommended exactly the same program. But I was effective in two cases with alcoholic and two cases with uh, cocaine addiction, where simple addition of nutrients allowed them to go from being alcoholics to regular and to being addicted to cocaine to being social cocaine users. Amino acids and vitamin C and cysteine are amazingly effective at giving them control. They were no longer out of control because they understood what was going on and they were now empowered to take the right steps. And if they didn't, they got into trouble. And if they did, they didn't. And that was all the incentive they needed to do it right. So on that basis, it's possible to be, let's say, very dependent on alcohol and say you drink most days. But having the right nutrients and amino acids, that could give you the biochemistry functioning in the right way so that then you don't feel you have the need to drink as much and you could then become a social drinker. Yes, but a lot of people who drink alcohol on a regular basis aren't alcoholics at all. So, for example, the people who drink a glass of red wine every evening, I mean, one drink is not enough to do that. And even if they drink two or three glasses, they may not be alcoholics at all. There's a legitimate use of alcohol, not only in terms of red wine delivering uh, certain things like grapeseed polyphenols and stuff like that, but also in terms of relaxation. All of us have a kind of wind up and wind down process that is part of our circadian rhythm. You need your tension during the day. You need your energy during the day to handle the traumas and the tribulations and all your workload. And, and then at the end of the day, you have to transition into sleep. And that sleep has to be relaxed. It has to be calm. And there has to be a certain tranquility involved. And more importantly, a lack of inflammation from being, you know, aroused and functional during the day to being peaceful and sleep at night. Mm -hmm. Alcohol does an amazing job of that. Now, it is true, as we talked about earlier, GHB will do the same thing, and you will sleep way better than you will on alcohol. That's kind of out of the question, unless you're a millionaire. Um, Zyron prescriptions are, you know, one to three thousand dollars a month for something that used to cost fifty. Is there a smart drug or the tropic that you would recommend for public speaking and people getting over that fear of public speaking? I have a history of stage fright. When I was a child, I got in, into a situation where I had, you know, flops at stage fright and developed a profound fear of public speaking. I found this book, Physiology and Pharmacology of Breathing, that basically allowed me to bring a variety of techniques to bear to desensitize myself and all. And so maybe five years ago, I went to about 500 people and gave an extemporaneous summary of a weekend's worth of a conference unscripted and I was comfortable during the entire time and so if you had told me that you know back when I was 25 I would have dismissed you as being a lunatic but you know I was able to do it so there are ways to help with that kind of process and that's what I used to become comfortable enough in a media situation to have my 15 minutes of fame but I did workshops and video workshops. I did them as a participant in front of the, you know, swipping back and forth in front and behind the camera. I assisted the workshop several times. I learned um, EFT therapy where you tap pressure points to overcome uh, nervousness, anxiety, and sympathetic mm -hmm. breathing patterns. I learned breathing patterns, how to force a parasympathetic breathing pattern on top of a sympathetic inclination. All kinds of techniques like that, and it was all entirely in my head and my body as well. Mm -hmm. And that allowed me to first 50,000 people, and then on television, then it was 200,000 people, and then it was 2 million people. So it became um, easy because of that feeling of control. What's your view on smart drugs helping people sleep? For at least 30, 35 years, I've had the opinion that Sleeping problems are one of the first things that show up in pretty much any kind of pathology. 
you're going to have COPD issues, you're going to have heart disease issues, you're going to have cancer issues, you're going to have autoimmune issues that years before you see there's an underlying sleep problem that shows up and that Mm -hmm. monitoring sleep is one of the most useful things that anybody can do to help them with their sleep. So what do you do to give yourself a great night's sleep, Stephen? You have a set routine Um, that you do. um, I found that liposomal melatonin is the best melatonin for me. It's the only melatonin that gives me a hypnotic effect where I actually feel sleepy from the melatonin. And that's a liponin inside of them. And they're absorbed through different membranes as, and each one, every time it goes through a membrane, it, it, the outer layer is shredded and the internal contents are released. And if there's a liposome inside of that, that goes to the next membrane. And so for getting things deep in the body and it's not just melatonin that's available this way. You've got glutathione that's available that way and very useful vitamin C, liposomal vitamin C. I use that live on vitamin C um, for any time I have the slightest issue, infection or a sore throat and I just take one packet of that stuff, open it up, take half of it, coat the throat, and then an hour later, do the other half. And oftentimes now I can avoid colds and flus. That's really my Achilles heel is mm. upper respiratory issues and sinus infections and lung infections and, and colds and flus. That's the thing that back before I was biohacking, I would have one every winter. What's your view on light at night? Because I know you've written quite extensively about light. Do anything like avoiding blue light at night? Yes. The evidence on blue light is very clear. Mm. You need to avoid blue light and anything at the energetic end of the spectrum, which would include definitely green light and maybe even yellow light, but certainly green and blue, and the blue being the most dangerous. But I'm not convinced there may be a, that there is a downside to red light, and I very much doubt that there's a downside to near-infrared light. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and so that's one of the things I'm currently actively involved in experimenting with and collecting reports from people about red and infrared light photons can enhance their mitochondria and mm-hmm. prevent their body from bottoming out at night while they're sleeping that allows them to sleep more deeply. And so I'm considering that constant illumination of night may be actually beneficial to sleep, may be contradictory to the total darkness dogma that's out there. It's a subtle technology. I mean, you're dealing with, um, you're pushing on a system that's in chondrial system energy. The electron transport system is intrinsically efficient, but because of that efficiency, it has a low flux and red light improves the flux of those um, electron flow. And so that can make a big difference, but the total effect on people is relatively subtle and many people will use red. I didn't notice anything when something really did happen, but they can't feel that something happened. And it's useful for healing. It's useful for neuralgias and neuropathies. It can be useful for inflammation control. It's a powerful technology. Mm-hmm. I'd like to thank Stephen for giving up the time to record two episodes with us for his amazing insights and incredible hacks. Don't forget to check out the other episode with Stephen Folks. Remember, if you would like to access our content one week before it's released, please leave your details at www upgradedexecutive.com forward slash subscribe and we will send you a special link so you can access the videos one week before we officially release them. You can also follow us on all of our social channels at connect with UE.